When a couple of fans who have done me some major favors asked me to review this show, I wasn't sure about it because I'd never seen it. But it starred John Eric Hexum, an actor that I had seen in a series called Cover Up, and I really liked it. So when those good folks offered to send me their DVD set so I could review it, I jumped at the chance. Metaphorically. I don't think I've actually tried to do any jumping since around 1994. One reason I decided to review it now is because I'm also in the process of reviewing the Time Tunnel. If you've been watching that, you know that it has a kind of similar plot with people traveling through time and fixing certain things that have gone wrong. As we know, the Time Tunnel couldn't make it more than one season despite its popularity. This show got a short season and then wasn't renewed, so we have 20 episodes to look at. It wouldn't be until later in the 80s that a show with this kind of plot would really catch on. I'm talking, of course, about Pee-wee's Playhouse. Oops, I mean Quantum Leap. Why did it succeed where these didn't? Was it the time the audience was ready for such a show where they weren't before? Was it Scott Bakula and Dean Stockwell? Was it the writing? What was it? Well, I'll tell you. I don't know. Television is a fickle medium. That's what it all boils down to. And we'll discover that Voyagers suffered much the same fate that the Time Tunnel did. We'll get to that in due time. Yes, that's a pun. Is this how we always start the show? It looks like the bad guys are attacking a fortress and one particular fighter is giving them inordinate amounts of trouble. Who is this kid? He fights like someone three times his age. You had to know that was coming. Swashbuckling dreams of saving the family from evil. I had a few of those as a kid. That's Jeffrey, our co-hero. And in the real world, his parents are dead. He lives with his aunt for the time being. Just I don't care. I just don't want him to ruin our trip to Cancun. A little boy's future isn't as important as his vacation. I haven't even seen this guy, and already I want to dangle him out the window by his toes until he gets a few priorities straight. Look, do you think I like being saddled with an 11-year-old kid? Oh, why did Bill and Kathy have to die? I'm sure they did it just to frustrate you. Some siblings will go to amazing lengths. As we saw, Jeffrey gets to hear the whole thing. Not only have his parents been ripped away from him, it's clear he's not wanted where he is. He's realizing the most horrible thing any human can experience. He's alone. Before Jeffrey could say anything, the dog attacked. The man lost his grip and plummeted to the street below. Nobody ever figured out who he was or how he got there. After two years of intense therapy, Jeffrey decided he dreamed the whole thing, just like that pirate sequence. That's Brett. Could have killed me. I start building on this high. This isn't 1492. Where's Columbus, kid? It's in Ohio. By bus, it's that way. Ralph! He's got my book! Ralph, let's go! Ralph, come on! Ralph, give it up! Let's go! Ralph tried to read the book, but it didn't taste good, so he gave up after a few pages. Too bad. It might have explained why Jeffrey and that other guy aren't splats on the pavement 50 stories below.
They've been banished to the Phantom Zone. General Zod is waiting. Just once I'd like to land on a haystack. I wonder why you have to land from such a crazy height to begin with. Are we alive? Alive? Oh no. He says, what year was that? Once Jeffrey figures out that he's serious, he tells him, 1982. Son, I'm not a man known for being patient. This year Omni's only got circuits to 1970. The only way I can get you to 82 is if the lousy thing Bat's breath. I've never been close enough to a bat to smell its breath, so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Bat's breath? Do you know how difficult it is to field strip one of these things? Well, now that depends. What was it? Where's my guidebook? <sighs> Gotta be around here somewhere. Well, help me, will ya? I already told you Ralph is reading it right now. You can have it when he's done. Our mystery guy isn't going to figure it out, so Jeffrey reminds him, the big furry thing with the teeth has it. Dude there says, I can't do a thing without it. Do you know what you've done? History's gonna change because you couldn't control your shaggy little mutt. Empires are gonna fall. Wars are gonna rage. I'm gonna lose my job! Well, it seems like a reasonable sequence of events. You lose the book, then you lose your job. Or maybe you lose your pocket watch somewhere in there, too. I don't know all the rules to this game. Your job? Who do you think you are? You break into my room, you knock me out a window, you bring me here, wherever I am. You deserve to lose your lousy job. Yeah! Yeah! Smart kids give me a pain. He was sitting there, minding his own business, listening to his aunt and uncle talk about what a burden he is to them. Some weird guy comes in with a book and a pocket watch and no idea where or when he is, drags Jeffrey along to wherever they are now. I don't know who you are, mister, but if those empires crumble and all the rest, it's coming out of your paycheck. Hey, where are we going? <laughs> where am I going? I'm going to salvage what's left of my job. You're gonna get lost. Seriously? You think you're gonna drag him to some unfamiliar place in time against his will and then walk away? I am lost. We know where they are now. They'll figure out that that's baby Moses in the basket. Pharaoh's daughter is hanging out on the other side of the river, so they need to unstick the basket from those reeds so it can float over there for her to find it. More precisely, Jeffrey will figure that out. The adult of the group can't put his pants on without his guidebook. Who are you? What are you? What am I? I am a voyager. You ever hear of one? Of course not. No one has. We're the people that are plucked out of time and trained to travel through the ages to help history along. You know, give it a shove where it's needed. He does that by way of that pocket watch, which he calls an Omni. When there's something that needs fixing, it shines red. When the thing has been fixed, it shines green. Green is good. And without the guidebook, he barely knows that. Why is he such an ignoramus? There's this blonde in my class. Real nice legs. And she had a mole right here. And this kind of mysterious way of talking. Kind of distracted me, you know? Oh, it's her fault for existing while hot. He figured everything is in the guidebook so he didn't need to listen. He could ogle his fantasy girl. And it worked until Ralph ate the guidebook. In any case, he has a green light for putting Moses back in the main channel of the Nile. How do you know? My dad was a history professor. Let me see. Which one do you press to... Our man hits the button real quick before those horses trample them, and here we go again. No. Hey, hey, easy. It's okay, kid. They almost ran over us. That ought to give you a pretty good idea why you'll never touch this Omni again. What am I saying? Nice to know you, kid. Sorry for any inconvenience, but I work alone. Oh, no, you don't. You got me in this, you get me out. So where and when are they? Can't take you back. I don't even know where I am. France, 1918. Revolutionary War. 
First World War! Explosions and gunfire start erupting in the street. The Germans are chasing someone. Hold it right there! That thing's dangerous. Will you put that down before... We're the good guys! Now get us out of here! Our Voyager puts on the riding gear and hops on the motorcycle to create a diversion. Motor Transportation 1A. Where you want it to go? Motor Transportation 1A. The clutch! Oh, the clutch. With the Germans sufficiently diversioned, Jeffrey and the lady can get the wounded man inside. Think he'll come back? He better. Who is he anyway? My father. Genetics being what they are, I'm smart even though he isn't. Later, what's his guidebook joins them in a cellar where they've taken refuge. He's managed to procure a German uniform for himself. You know who this is? No, son, but I'm sure you'll introduce us. This is Mary Murphy. Mary Murphy, the actress. And this is my father. Phineas Bogg. Phineas? Phineas. He's got a brother named Ferb, but that's a story for another time. We'll call him Bog because it's easier to say. Phineas and Mary head out to find a truck so they can sneak the wounded man back to friendly lines. I heard about your wife. Wife? Jeffrey told me how she died. Oh, Jeffrey. You know, I think it's wonderful the way you're bringing him up on your own. I, uh, really haven't done that much. You're modest. I love a modest man. Suddenly, he's all set to show her how humble he is. She spots the truck they need. All they have to do is get a couple of German soldiers away from it. Mary says, leave that to me. How could you do this to me? Do you know what this does to me? What are you doing? No, that's not to me. I hate you. I hate you. <laughs> Remember, 1918 was silent film time. This is the first time these guys have ever seen a talkie. Eddie Rickenbacker? You're the Eddie Rickenbacker? Yeah, sure, I guess. Corporal Eddie Rickenbacker, Columbus, Ohio. But what are you doing here? Kid, I was gonna ask you. But you're the number one ace. You should be up in the air dogfighting. Dogfighting? I hate to tell you, but dogs don't fly. The only thing that's up in the air these days is Zeppelins and the Jerry's are taking us to the cleaners with them. You mean we're losing the war? A little more probing and Jeffrey finds the problem. Nobody has ever heard of the Wright brothers. Some British guy has been trying to develop a working airplane, but all his prototypes keep taking nosedives in the English Channel. So the German Zeppelins are the masters of the air and they're a big factor in why Germany is winning. He finds Bog and says, we have to go to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, 1903, and find the Wright Brothers. That's another one, kid. Face it. No one here's even heard of the Wright Brothers. Even Jeffrey can make a mistake. No airplanes means they never made it to Kitty Hawk. They developed their invention in Dayton, Ohio. They just flew it at Kitty Hawk. He says, Dayton is where we have to go. No, kid. This is it. Time to part our ways. You're in America, same century. That may be the best I can do, so why don't we just say forget Cannon, it? You stuck with me until you put me back in my room where you got me. Besides, you don't know anything about history. You messed the whole thing up. He thought 1918 was the American Revolution, didn't know that Germany lost the war, doesn't know who the Wright brothers are, and can't figure out how his Omni got into 1982 in the first place, much less how to get it to go back there again. Without Jeffrey, I have a feeling he might hurt himself. Now, what's his father business, huh? I haven't met a girl like that in 300 years, and you tell her you're my son? You know what that could do to my reputation? She was ready to throw herself at you because of it, genius. He is not paying attention. What about your old father? What would he say? My father's dead. And if he's anything like me, you probably did him in, too. Just shut up! Hey, Jeff. I'm sorry, Jeffrey. He knows he went too far. He holds Jeffrey until the hysteria passes. Then it's time to learn more about this kid he's suddenly stuck with, who knows enough history to serve as his replacement guidebook. We were going camping up north. I was in the camper reading some comics. 
I don't know. Dad must have fallen asleep. Because we ran off the road into some trees. I was all right. But Mom and Dad got real smashed up. I can't imagine being 11 and having to see that. I tried to get him out. But there was this fire. I went up to the road to try to get someone to help. But no one would stop. Off to Dayton. As quick as they find the Wright Brothers bike shop, Bog starts concentrating on the important stuff. This is it. It certainly is. Good afternoon. Forget it, Bog. She isn't blonde. <clears throat> nice day. It certainly is. Phineas Bog. <laughs> Agnes. Spence. He's doing a scientific study on feminine pulchritude. He plans to publish it in a couple hundred years once he's done enough research. Morning. You gents looking for some help? Morning. Just a minute. She wanted me to ask her out. You know that she's my girl. Or... Oh. Well, this hurts to say, Will. But Agnes doesn't even like you. They're arguing about Agnes, the woman outside who was just flirting with Bog. Already, I conclude they'd both do well to stay away from her. She thinks this whole flying idea of yours is crazy and childish. And Agnes is the reason they never built their plane. They were too busy fighting over whose heart she'll break first. Uh, gentlemen, excuse me. Uh, Just one minute. Wait a second. Flying is my idea? Who spent 10 days flying this box kite, huh? Hmm? Huh? Huh? Who spent four sleepless nights designing these swings? Huh? Who worked for a solid month building this model? Nice, Jeffrey. The brothers are still arguing and destroying all their models and prototypes. Agnes likes her men... mature. Uh-uh. Agnes likes men, period. And she's not about to be exclusive to either of you two idiots, so it's time for both of you to start thinking with the big head and make history. But they aren't listening. Wilbur quits and walks out. All this over a girl. Jeffrey doesn't understand. Oh, to be that innocent again? No thanks. Bog is fixing the glider while he and Jeffrey work on a plan to get the boys back together. This is a case of three people being confused about what they really want. Agnes thinks she wants love, when all she really cares about is romance. Orville and Wilbur think they want Agnes, when all they really care about is flying. Think this will work? If I read them right, they see this fly and Agnes is a memory. And now for a little subterfuge to get them both in the same place so they can see it fly. Dearest Wilbur, I have so many things to tell you. Orville means nothing to me. Meet me at Big Rock. Dearest Ridge. Orville, I have so many things to tell you. Wilbur means nothing to me. Thing is, in both notes, that's true. As Bog said, she just wants romance. She doesn't care whom she gets it from. Meet me at Big Rock Creek this morning at 10 o'clock. Dearest Agnes, my heart stopped when I saw you outside the shop. Forget the Wright brothers. I'll be at Big Rock Creek this morning at 10. Even better, she thinks Bog is going to be her new conquest. If he gets the chance. But this is a family show, so it won't happen, thankfully. Agnes arrives first. Phineas! Phineas? Nope, that's not Phineas. And neither is that. Suddenly, Agnes is ready to go home. The three of them are together and figuring out that they all got hoodwinked. It's time for Bog to take off in their glider. <laughs> I don't know why Jeffrey's screaming. It appears to be working even during the commercial break. See, we're back from the break and he's still flying. Their design works. I don't know what to say, Wilbur Orville. This is not my handwriting. Well then, who in tarnation? I wonder if he did that on purpose or if it was just a happy accidental choice of words. With Bog, you never know. Our glider. Will, it, it, it's our glider. And it's flying. Phineas! 
I think he has everybody's attention, but he forgot to consider one question, how to land this thing. I guess that works, but without some major repairs, you'll only do it once. Phineas! Oh, Phineas! Mm, your soaring love, it was wonderful! Oh, oh, look at you! He just took a nosedive into the ground. You expected what? Are you all right? A little worse for wear, darling. Mm. But now I know more than ever that I want to marry you. Marry me? And this is how you cool off a woman like Agnes, give her what she thought she wanted. Yes, ever since the first day I saw you, I, I knew we'd grow old together. You and me and our ten children. Ten children? Children are kind of a side effect of romance and marriage. Until this moment, she hadn't really thought about that. She was just enjoying the game. Why don't you wait for me in the buggy? I'll be right there. <laughs> Wilbur, Orville. I love the way their expressions when they look at each other are saying, we were fighting over that? Their minds are often running about how to make this thing work better, and they start talking about Kitty Hawk. Mission accomplished? Green light, Kit. But we can't leave now. Not yet. Got to. But they're going to invent the airplane. We can be there. We can help. You already did. You know that one big ripple effect from this will be how World War I ends. You were just there. We've helped enough already. Look, I know it's hard. I've been there, too. But whenever you feel this way, you got to think of all the interesting people in front of you. Bug says, I really need your help. We're voyagers. We have responsibilities. He kind of overlooks the fact that Jeffrey didn't sign up for this, and until today he had no idea what a Voyager was. But Jeffrey is amazingly resilient. Eleven-year-olds are like that. It's only when we reach so-called adulthood that we seem to develop a giant stick up our feet and refuse to bend with the circumstances. Besides, don't you want to see what all this has done? Yeah. You can go back and talk to the real historical Eddie Rickenbacker now. He'll be in a plane where he belongs. Thanks to what you and Bog did here. You can watch the beginning of the process, or you can watch the worldwide effect it had on humanity from a hundred different angles. That's not a hard decision. There's just one loose end to tie up. Phineas! You know, I've really been thinking. It's about those... Ten children? I really think that I'm just too young to have ten children. Phineas? But that's not a problem. It was already taking care of itself. A haystack. I'm pretty sure that's actually straw, but it's better than pavement. Green light? Still red. Now where are your planes, kid? Look behind you. I think I see your answer. Put Orville and Wilbur back on the right track. They gotta be around here somewhere. I suppose right could mean that something else is wrong. Uh, we'll find out soon enough. That looks like a German Fokker, one of the few planes that had three wings and it's red. That means it's the Red Baron himself, Von Richthofen. And Eddie and Mary aren't far away. I'm Phineas back. This is Jeff, my son. We're here to help you. You okay? That arm looks pretty bad. Eddie has a wound in his left shoulder. His arm is pretty well useless. I'm alive, which is more than I can say for the guys on the escort plane. We are on our way to an entertainment troupe in the front lines when the Baron shot us down. Hit the deck! He dropped a glove. He's challenging Eddie to a sky duel. Top German ace against top American ace. But there's no way Eddie can take up the challenge with that bullet wound. Bog will take his place while he flies Mary to safety. The Baron won't fire on an unarmed plane. Fly down, Jet. I'm doing this solo. Good thing he knows how to fly one of these. Who's gonna shoot the gun? No discussion. That's it. Get down. Hey, where's the clutch? Or not. 
The thing doesn't have a clutch. Smart kids give me a pain. I don't think Jeffrey knows how to fly one either, but at least he knows it doesn't have a clutch. Remember the main. Remember the what? You know, the main. The ship that sunk and helped start the Spanish-American War in 1898. The one that has nothing to do with right now. I think Bog learned most of his history from watching Mr. Peabody. He's right behind you! Get him off your tail! Use the gun, Jeffrey. Now go down and get on his tail. No, stay out. We're gonna stop. We're gonna what? Gonna that. Needless to say, he manages to pull out of it. Where's the Baron? He's right on our tail. Shut up. What a novel idea. So that's what that machine gun is for. As far as I've been able to discover, Eddie Rickenbacker and the Red Baron never met face to face in aerial combat. The Baron was the leader of a squadron known as the Flying Circus, and Rickenbacker's squadron battled them multiple times. But from what I can find, this dogfight never happened. And the truth is, nobody ever shot the Red Baron down. In 1918, he was in a dogfight with two Sopwith camels, and one stray bullet hit him right in the heart. With his dying breath, he landed the plane to make sure nobody got hurt. He was 25. Still, we'll do whatever it takes to get that green light. We're not going down, kid. You knew it wasn't going to be that easy. The Omni does its thing and they're alive. Somewhere. Where exactly is that? England, 1066. Pearl Harbor. Wrong ocean, wrong island, wrong century. Other than that, you're correct, Bog. That's it. Huh? That's what's wrong. They didn't have cannons in 1066. Battle of Hastings. Battle of what? Jeffrey is right. Europeans didn't discover gunpowder until well after 1066. I have a feeling they're going to have to go back a little further to sort this one out. But they'll do that next week. Right now they're scampering like rabbits. I like this. Some of Boggs' historical gaffes are a little over the top, but given some of the things you see on the internet, they're believable. And I like John Eric Hexham. I hope that in a way I can make this review series a little tribute to him. As I said, I knew him from Cover Up, a series he was doing with Jennifer O'Neill when he died. In case you don't know, one day on the set he was messing with a prop pistol. He put it up to his head and pulled the trigger. Look, if you're a gun enthusiast, fine. Never point it at yourself or anyone else, even if it's a prop gun that shoots blanks. The wad from the blank cartridge shattered his skull and killed him. He did manage to outlive the Red Baron. He was 26. Mino Peluche, who plays Jeffrey, was 12 when he did this, and he had been acting since he was 7. One little fun fact about him, in this series he's a whiz at history because his dad teaches it. As an adult, he has spent time teaching history. I hope Bog was paying attention this time. 